Okay, so thank you, Dr. Samuels, for coming to comment on our Neurology Morning Report case today. Pleasure. It's nice to be here, Tracy. Well, thank you. Neurology Morning Report, Case 60. This is an 80-year-old man with two weeks of altered mental status. He presents for a second opinion. He has a two-week history of intermittent slurred speech, trouble walking, and episodes of confusion. He's become progressively worse and is now unable to always recognize family. He's unable to follow simple commands, walk, feed himself, and he has episodes of incontinence. He was admitted to another hospital. His workup did not reveal a definitive etiology. He was started on levetiracetam and carbidopa levodopa with no improvement. His past medical history is significant for peptic ulcer with a GI bleed one month ago requiring 14 units of blood transfusion. He has atrial fibrillation and is a morphine and a history of a mitral valve replacement. His social history shows he does not smoke, drink alcohol, or use drugs. His examination shows that his vital signs are stable. He has no focal findings on his neurologic examination. He's noted to be lethargic, lying on a stretcher, and is oriented times two. His pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light. His extracular movements are intact, and his face is symmetric. His motor examination was documented as increased tone and not following commands to test his strength. Reflexes are two plus in the bilateral upper extremities, one plus in the bilateral lower extremities, and his toes are down going. His MRI is shown here with some representative images. It shows moderate to severe microvascular disease. There are no enhancing lesions, no hemorrhagic lesions, and no areas of restricted diffusion. Laboratory results show normal chemistries and liver function tests, and normal CBC, and the INR of 3.1, which is explained by his use of Coumadin. His urine analysis shows 32 white blood cells, and the urine culture is pending. On this slide, I do give you a clue as to what laboratory test was sent and resulted in an abnormality that was critical in determining the etiology of his altered mental status. This was his EEG um, example of what it might have looked like at the outside hospital. His EEG currently shows bilateral slowing. And the team held his warfarin um, in anticipation of doing a lumbar puncture. In the meantime, a laboratory test was abnormal. That test was as ammonia, which resulted at 82. Uh, you know, 80 is a, a little high. It doesn't blow you away. But is that it? Is that the, the, the whole story? So um, after the level of, of 82 was obtained, um, the team further investigated whether the hyperammonemia could in fact be responsible for his mental status changes by um, starting with a GI consultation. And the GI consultant said exactly what you just said. <laughs> but yeah. they went on to do an ultrasound yeah, but don't don't tell me anymore, okay? I, mm -hmm. I don't want to be too biased about uh, about this because you know there's something uh, called the framing heuristic where uh, you de one develops a theory based on the way the case is framed, and uh, the framing is not meant to be uh, a bad thing, like being framed uh, uh, for a crime. Uh, the framing is the way the case is presented, and it's often presented by another doctor. This, this is what's happening to me today. Another doctor is presenting the case, mm -hmm. but it could be the patient, could be the patient's family, could be the, uh, uh, the EMTs uh, who have a theory about it. And uh, they present it in a certain, in a certain way, and uh, it's framed. Um, so this case, just just so the people listening can, I'll, be, I'll uh, reveal what's in my mind about this, and then we'll talk about the various possibilities. 
this is this has been framed up till this point as a as a case of a hyperammonemic encephalopathy, right? That's that's the that that's what I'm supposed to think about, uh, and and that's because uh, the doctor said that the ammonia was positive. It led the doctors to do a bunch of other things, and uh, it, it's okay to have a theory. I don't know any of you if any of you have read uh, Daniel Kahneman's. Uh, book thinking fast and thinking slow but uh, if you have it it's a, it's a book that every doctor should read he talks about two systems in the nervous system that function in parallel one is the fast thinking system for survival in the wild he calls that system one we would call that the limbic system the limbic brain and then we have the cognitive the slow cognitive uh, processing which is the cortex uh, in our life that he calls that uh, he calls that system two. You can't resist system one. It's automatic. It's deep in the brain. You remember uh, Paul McLean's triune brain, where there's the cerebral cortex, and under that is the limbic system, and under that is the reptilian brain of the hypothalamus and all of its connection to the autonomic nervous system. You can't control it. So I'm going to give you a test, all of you who are listening. I want you to inhibit the following command. I'm about to give you the command. Don't do it. You ready? Uh, picture a map of the United States. And uh, where, where is the COVID the worst right now? Uh, it's impossible to inhibit that, isn't it? And if I had a PET scanner and I could stick your head in the PET scanner, I could prove that you couldn't resist it because your occipital poles would light up as being active. You can't resist it. You you must see that map. And if you saw the New York Times today, you would see that the right lower quadrant, uh, the southeast, is the place where a lot of the hottest spots are. Um, that's that's system one. And my system one says to me, uh, this case is framed as a uh, as an ammonia case. Uh, I'm very interested in ammonia, as Dr. Milligan knows. And therefore, this has got to be an ammonia case. Now you can see, I could be right, but it's also possible that this heuristic, this shortcut has misled me. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the heuristic and you can't resist it. Uh, the, there's no sense denying it. And the more experienced you are, the faster you think. And so, you know, I'm an old guy. I've been thinking about the liver and brain for a long time. Good friend of mine calls me and says, I'd like you to come on with me today and talk about a liver case, a uh, liver brain case. I've really got a strong bias uh, that this is a liver brain case. But let's think through it and shift to, to system two. Um, what, what I'm asking you to do is to, is to not ignore or deny that system one has been active, but to bring it to consciousness and actually say to yourself, I feel as though I'm getting framed. Not purposely, not by bad people, just being framed. So what do we see here? This is a, a, an encephalopathy that's not very well uh, described. We, 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 that's not Dr. Milligan's fault. She's reading what, what was said. You can't really tell exactly what's wrong with him. Is there something wrong with his attention? Is it his language? Is it his level of consciousness? What is it? Because those would tell us where the lesions are in the nervous system and that might, uh, that might help us. But in any case, he has a, a, an encephalopathy which, is, which has a certain pace. Neurology is localization and pace. That's all there is to it. All the rest is, uh, is commentary. That's Rabbi Hillel said that, you know, take, treat people <laughs> where you want to be treated. Uh, and all the rest is commentary. Uh, and that's what this is. All the rest is commentary. It's uh, localization and pace. And what's the pace? Uh, it's a few weeks. Right, Dr. Milligan? It's a few weeks, that's right? right? So just a couple weeks. You have to say to yourself, again, say it out loud if necessary. What's the pace? There's only four possibilities. It's acute, subacute, chronic, or episodic. Uh, which is it? It's, uh, it's a subacute encephalopathy with preserved reflexes in the lower, uh, lower extremity and a very complicated and sick, um, sick person. Um, so it's, it's, it's symmetrical. We didn't hear about hemiparesis or 
uh, gaze paresis or hemianopia or language disorder, any of those things. So we, we can't say which side it's on. So it's likely something in the blood that's uh, not biased and goes to both hemispheres and the brain stem, uh, the front of the brain, the back of the brain. So it's probably some kind of uh, encephalopathy. Um, the MRI is not helpful. It was not positive. And so you begin to say to yourself, not everything in this thing fits with, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, with an ammonia case. Because uh, in uh, acute, what used to be called hepatic encephalopathy, we call it portosystemic encephalopathy now, uh, there's a very characteristic abnormality in the basal ganglia on the T1 images. We don't know how sensitive it is because we, we don't know what the gold standards are, but it's fairly sensitive and usually is abnormal. So that's funny. Number two, the EEG uh, doesn't have the typical findings of somebody with an ammonia problem, the way it's been interpreted. And Dr. Milligan is an expert in EEG. So I have high confidence that when she says that, that it was slow, that it was slow. If it had triphasic sharp waves, she would have said it and uh, didn't say it. Or well, our, our EEG was slow. I think the one at the outside hospital had triphasic waves. Ah, okay. Well, so that's uh, a, a sensitive but not specific test of a metabolic encephalopathy. Uh, when I was a medical resident, I was taught that this was liver failure, but in actual fact, that's not true. Many metabolic encephalopathies uh, cause triphasic waves and slowing. So we're still in the category of general generalized metabolic encephalopathy. Um, uh, now, what about this uh, ammonia? They did a lot of tests. If we do 100 tests, how many of those tests are going to be abnormal? Well, you know how a laboratory figures out what normal is, right? They do 100 tests, or there are 1,000 tests. They make a bell-shaped curve, and they figure out the mean and two standard deviations from the mean. Uh, above and below the mean. That means that if you do 100 tests, two and a half tests are going to be abnormal because they're high, and two and a half tests are going to be abnormal because they're low just by chance. Uh, the usual metabolic encephalopathy caused by ammonia produces incredibly high ammonias in the hundreds, not just 100, often 300, 400, 500. When, when ammonia is the cause. So what's the story behind ammonia? So I'm gonna tell you this in three minutes or less. Uh, for, for, for generations, for centuries, doctors have thought that ammonia was the cause of hepatic encephalopathy. And that's what I was taught when I was in medical school. And then with the advances in neuroscience, people began to think of other more sophisticated possible causes and that the two big ones were that there were, there were endogenous benzodiazepines with receptors that uh, are, are drugs that benzodiazepines look for. After all, we wouldn't have an effect of the benzodiazepines if we didn't have receptors. And why would we have receptors if we didn't have a naturally occurring agonist? So there are naturally occurring benzos and maybe they're not being metabolized by the sick liver. And that's why, uh, if you give, a, if you give a, a benzodiazepine antagonist, you can transiently make people a little bit better and their EEG gets better and their triphasic waves go away. But it turns out that's not the chronic, that the treatment that works chronically. It only works for a little while. Well, maybe there's a false neurotransmitter. Professor Sheila Sherlock, the liver queen, now deceased, sadly, uh, looked for decades for a false neurotransmitter. And she based that on the fact that they, they noticed that certain aspects of metabolic encephalopathy would get better if they gave an anti-Parkinsonian medication. And so she thought that dopamine might be the, the problem and they actually treated certain patients with bromocryptine. And there was one version of, of, of ammonia encephalopathy um, which responded very well to bromocryptine, and that is the progressive paraparesis or the uh, paraparesis of hepatic or portosystemic encephalopathy. This guy has a touch of that. He's got reflexes in a person who, otherwise, we, we would expect would probably have 
uh, low reflexes, and he has increased tone, spasticity. So this is known as hepatic paraplegia. I saw some of these cases when I was over there working with her, and it was true that when they gave bromocryptine, some of these patients would walk out of the hospital. It was very dramatic. But unfortunately, it didn't work for the chronic hepatic encephalopathy on the brain. So they gave up on that idea, and lo and behold, they came back to ammonia. So we started with ammonia, and we ended with ammonia. Uh, but there was a twist, and the twist is that the glial cells turn out to be the cells that uh, metabolize ammonia in the central nervous system. You all know that the, the, that the urea cycle does this in the rest of the body, but the brain doesn't have the urea cycle. So how does it metabolize ammonia? Well, it uses glutamate to glutamine, converts glutamate to glutamine by incorporating ammonia. <clears throat> and that glutamine is excreted and goes into the spinal fluid. And we all know that we can measure that under some circ circumstances. So it is, it's very interesting that after all this time, we've come back to ammonia as being the probable toxin in hepatic encephalopathy. And the final point about this is, although it was always called hepatic encephalopathy, it shouldn't be called hepatic encephalopathy because you don't have to have a sick liver to have hepatic encephalopathy. The, the first uh, uh, observation of this type was in patients who got the ECK fistula. An ECK fistula is a surgically made splenorenal shunt that was made to treat esophageal varices and increase portal pressure. And I have to tell you, when I first read this case, I thought to myself, well, this is a guy with cirrhosis and portal hypertension who had a big GI bleed. I mean, this guy had a life-threatening GI bleed, 14-unit GI bleed. And they called it uh, peptic ulcer disease, but it wasn't peptic ulcer disease. It was actually esophageal varices. Uh, that kind of bleed is much more like esophageal varices than, than it is uh, from, from a peptic bleeding peptic ulcer. And I thought, well, there is the case. That's, uh, that's all there is to it. It's poor systemic encephalopathy. And that's Sheila's, Sheila Sherlock. I'm not calling her Sheila. Professor Sherlock uh, said we should call this porto systemic encephalopathy. The shunts can be in the liver or they can be outside the liver. In people with... Uh, uh, with ordinary uh, hepatic cirrhosis, Lenex cirrhosis. Uh, uh, the shunts are often intrahepatic. And one of the many things that I saw her do that was so spectacular at the bedside was to listen to the liver with her stethoscope. I don't know how many of you do that, but I now do it. I can tell you that because she would, liver, she would listen to the liver and she would turn to us, those making rounds with her, and she said, there's a shunt in that liver. Um, and uh, that means uh, that this guy's got portal systemic encephalopathy. The tests they did were very, very simple tests. They looked for asterixis, hold the hands out and see if they flap or one finger up to see if it drops, uh, which almost always was present in people with portal systemic encephalopathy. Now, the doctors here didn't look for it. That's shameful that they didn't look for it. But uh, I don't know, but I, uh, if it's portal systemic encephalopathy, he sure should have had uh, uh, asterixis if he has that kind of um, encephalopathy. Uh, and they would have people draw uh, geometric diagrams, and every day they would come around on rounds and they'd have the same, draw the same one again. And uh, as it deteriorated, they could see the encephalopathy getting worse. It's a sort of a, a, miniature ma uh, a miniature MOCA test on uh, encephalopathy. You could also use the EEG, but that's a little too high tech. Uh, at the bedside, you just have to make geometrical diagrams um, and look for a asterixis. They also have an odor to them that you can uh, recognize and it smells a little like ammonia actually when, when you come in the room. And again, Professor Sherlock would all, uh, come in the room and she would sit <laughs> hepatic encephalopathy, porter systemic encephalopathy. <laughs> Pretty remarkable, pretty amazing. Of course, if she was biased, of course, because she was a liver doctor and, I, and everybody in the world sent her the hardest liver cases. So if she said PSE, she was usually, she was usually right. Um, as, so in summary of what I have to say, it doesn't sound like portal systemic encephalopathy, despite the elevated ammonia. And um, 
what they went on to do is a question of whether whether what you learn by doing additional tests when you find an abnormal test that doesn't fit the clinical picture perfectly is incidental illness. And uh, that's, the mo that's the greatest danger of getting MRIs when they aren't indicated or getting any tests when it's not indicated, like genetic tests. Uh, it's not the cost. The cost is bad, but that's not the main reason. Uh, the main reason is that you turn up incidental illness for which uh, that had nothing to do with the illness uh, and which scare people, frighten them, and often cost them money and risk because the doctors do things to them that actually are not necessary. Uh, and then, of course, after they do the thing that they do to them, when the natural history of disease is to get better of a disease like a metabolic encephalopathy, they attribute their intervention uh, to, the, to the improvement in the patient. They say, well, we fix this patient by doing this, but actually it's what the statisticians call regression to the mean, right? So if you have a bad day playing golf today, tomorrow your game is likely to be better. Uh, even though you didn't do anything any different. I mean, statistically, it's likely to be better and, and vice versa. And that's true of um, metabolic encephalopathy. So if you come in the hospital and you're put on a good diet and the right kind of IVs and you start to get better, the doctors say, well, it's because we clipped the toenails on, on day three. We clipped the toenails and the, and the patient got better. So that's my take without knowing what the doctors do. Well, go ahead, well, Tracy. Tell well, us. thank tell you. <laughs> I am. <laughs> thank you for completely disagreeing with the with the diagnosis I've given the audience on Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh, this is why we have more than report, right? This is why we have more. Than the patient underwent an ultrasound, and it showed a very large porto systemic shunt. Um, in, the in the liver, or where was the sh where was the shunt? In the liver. In the liver, yeah. In the liver, yeah. Mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. was there a brewery? Yeah. Um, there probably would have been a brewery if somebody had listened. <laughs> <laughs> right, so there was an intrahepatic shunt. Yes. How there long do you think, cool. how long do you think that's been there? So initially, um, People wondered if it was if it was acute, but specialists came and said, "No, this kind of shunt, you know, only develops over time." And so probably that shunt had been there for quite a while, and the GI bleed yeah, uh, sure. unmasked this um, portosystemic shunt. Um, so he had the hyperaminemia treated with lactulose. He showed sh some improvement in his mental status and then went on to have embolization of this shunt. And after the embolization, it was a dramatic improvement in his mental status. That's right. That's so it, there was some um, further um, questioning about how did he develop this? and whether this could have been a result um, of his cardiac disease because he had severe tricuspid regurgitation mm. and whether it could have been um, so-called cardiac cirrhosis. He did have a liver biopsy that didn't show any frank cirrhosis, but it seemed, um, you know, those are all the, that's all the data that we were able to obtain and, and closing that shunt did clinically improve him. Yeah. Or he improved as the on the day that he had his shunt fixed. Yeah, if everybody was taken in <laughs> by this, <laughs> the doctors, the patient, and the family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad he's. Yeah. I'm glad he's better. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I don't think that it, that an ammonia of eighty two just doesn't doesn't do it for me. Um, and uh, whether he improved on lactulose or not, lactulose is a weak treatment to begin with. I hope everybody understands what lactulose is. It's, a, it's an artificially made um, disaccharide for which, because it's artificial, it has no enzymes in the upper GI tract. There are no enzymes to <clears throat> break it apart, break it up. So it passes all the way to the colon. 
And in the colon, of course, there are bacteria. The bacteria do have the enzymes and they will metabolize the lactulose and produce hydrogen ions. And those hydrogen ions will latch onto the NH3 and make it NH4 and the NH4 will go out in the stool. So you have to give enough lactulose to cause diarrhea. And we used to also give enemas with neomycin and uh, to try to sterilize the guts so that the, um, the, the colon, so they wouldn't uh, be there to metabolize. Um, and uh, for, for acute treatment of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. Did the EEG also improve, Tracy, that it turned to normal? Um, the EEG was not tested again. I see, okay. But his mental status um, was said to go back to normal. And um, I mean, certainly the GI bleed is, is very well known to, um, to uh, precipitate decompensation in people with cirrhosis. There's, there's no doubt. And he had a very significant... Um, uh, a very significant GI bleed. Yeah, you sure can. Showing this big shot. I see it. It's nice, huh? And then his um, embolization. Here they're injecting the hepatic artery and has this big um, portal shunt that we can see. And then they embolized it and the shunt went away. Beautiful uh, job, huh? Very nice. <laughs> It didn't have to do an open operation. Well, thank well, you. We, we can't prove it one way or the other. I'm, I'm, I remain suspicious about, about the relationship, but the important thing in medicine is to make the patients better. So uh -huh. I'm, glad that he, I'm glad that he's better. Um, there are <laughs> other diseases that cause intrahepatic shunts. Osler Weber Rondu is a, is a disease that causes hepatic shunts, in, as well as shunts in the mucous membranes. Could he have a disorder of that type? Okay. So when I was a medical student at the University of Cincinnati, uh, third year medical student, um, we uh, had our physical examination uh, test, you know, where we had to um, go in and take a history and examine the patient in internal medicine, my patient was at the VA, which was a little, you know, a short walk from the main medical center, and um, it was a stressful thing, you know, to sit there in front of an internist and have to, as a medical student, and try to try to do this. So I go, I go in there, and um, a very nice patient, very nice uh, guy named uh, Mr. Goldstein or something to that effect. Uh, I'm not going to use a real name, but it was something like Mr. Goldstein. And I introduced myself to Mr. Goldstein, and you can see that he's got lesions on his lips and um, other places in his skin, and uh, there were lesions in the mucous membranes, and, and I'm starting to sweat. Uh, I examine the guy, and I don't really know what the hell this is. <laughs> and, you know, time is passing, and my history is over. And I'm trying to figure out, I'm thinking to myself, what could this, you know, could this be? So I lean forward to listen to his, um, <laughs> listen to his heart. And I, you know, my ear is near his lips. And he looks at me and he says, you look like a nice Jewish boy. It's Osler Weber Rondu. <laughs> 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 my first case of Osler Weber Rondu. And I probably have only seen a couple in my whole rest of my career. You anyhow, see how, how patients are our greatest teachers. <laughs> he, he was so, such a nice man. Um, but they get, they get hepatic shunts, I think. Yeah. And there, there, there must be others. That, that's some kind of syndrome. Yeah. Big giant atria, atrial fibrillation. Shunts in the liver. I accept it as some kind of weird PSE. Well, thank you, Marty. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuels, for joining us for Hashtag Neurology Morning Report.